Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're doing Epic History TV's Alexander the Great Part 4. Let's get into it. At the age of just 22, Alexander, ruler of the small Greek kingdom of Macedonia, had led an invasion of the vast Persian Empire. After a string of victories, he smashed Persian military power at the Battle of Gaugamela and took the Persian throne for himself. Now, in 330 BC, Alexander continued his march east. His goal, to find and kill Bessus, a Persian usurper claiming to be the rightful king and to subjugate the Empire's eastern provinces. Alexander headed first for Arya, today part of Afghanistan, where the Persian governor Sati Barzanes had launched a revolt after initially pretending to submit to Alexander. The rebellion was crushed and Sati Barzanes killed in single combat by a Greek cavalry officer. Nearby, Alexander founded the city of Alexandria Ariana, modern Herat, one of around a dozen cities that Alexander would eventually found, almost all bearing his name. Alexander marched on to Frada. The Macedonian court had a long tradition of plots and assassination, Six years before, Alexander's own father, King Philip, had been murdered by his bodyguard. He was now informed that Philotas, commander of his companion cavalry, had uncovered a plot to assassinate Alexander, but kept it secret. Philotas and his father, Parmenion, were among the most respected of Alexander's commanders, and had played crucial roles in all his great victories. But when Philotas confessed, under torture, Alexander had him executed, then sent assassins back to Ecbatana, where Parmenion was governor, to kill him before he even heard of his son's death and had a chance to turn against Alexander. In 329, Alexander resumed his pursuit of Bessus. En route, he founded the city of Alexandria Aracosia, modern Kandahar in southern Afghanistan. Think about how far this is. He is now on the far eastern side of Afghanistan, having started north of Greece. This is so incredibly far to move. And at this time, they don't fight during the winter in the vast majority of cases. So these are campaigns that take place eight, nine months out of the year, and in six years, this is how far he's gotten. It's really, really wild how big these empires are. As he reached Kunduz, Bessus was betrayed by his own men and handed over in chains. Alexander sent him back to Persia for execution as a kingslayer. Alexander pushed on into modern Tajikistan, where the Sogdians rose up against him. He had to fight off attacks by local tribes and take several towns by assault. On the banks of the Jaxartes River, he founded the city of Alexandria Escate, meaning Alexandria the Furthest so named because he had, at last, reached the limit of the Persian Empire. This frontier was frequently raided by nomads, known to the Greeks as Scythians. Alexander lured them into a decisive battle near the Chaxartes. The 
result was a crushing victory for the Macedonian king that put an end to the raids. But fighting against Bactrian and Sogdian tribes continued, frustrating Alexander and tying him down in a difficult guerrilla war. So this is one of the things that the Persians had to deal with constantly, and I mean constantly, is they had all of these revolts of their in their empire. And you can see this if you read chronologically through the history of the Persian Empire. It is literally a conspiracy and then a revolt and then a conspiracy and then a revolt. And it's just one after the other after the other. A lot of these places have revolted 5, 6, 10, 15 times since the Persian Empire has taken over. And think about what revolt means in this time period. Revolt could very easily be the end of everything and everybody that you know. If you are one of these peoples that has decided that just something about the new regime rubs you the wrong way enough or you want independence enough that you're going to revolt. On, on the pro side of this, if you win, you get your independence, you overthrow the, your you know foreign tyrant and all of that. But if you lose, your city's probably destroyed. You and everybody you know is probably killed. You know, the women of your village or, or city or whatever are probably raped and sold into slavery. I mean, it is literally the end of your world if you lose. And so it's kind of wild to me how often some of these ancient civilizations and cities actually would revolt knowing full well what would happen if they lost. It's, it's really crazy. By now, many of the Macedonian troops were unhappy with Alexander. Most had not seen their homes in years, but their king seemed bent on conquest without end. What was worse, he'd begun to adopt the rituals and dress of their defeated Persian enemy, customs they viewed as effeminate and decadent. At Marakanda, modern Samarkand, after a furious, drunken argument, Alexander killed Clytus the Black. Clytus had been one of Alexander's best generals, and the man who'd saved his life at the Battle of the Granicus. Alexander was full of remorse, but his growing arrogance was alienating more and more old comrades. When he tried to make his countrymen perform the traditional Persian ritual of proskinesis, prostrating themselves before the king, he crossed a line. To Greeks, this was blasphemy. Only a god was worthy of such respect, and Alexander was forced to back down. In Bactria, another plot to assassinate Alexander was uncovered. This time, the ringleader was a royal page, one of the sons of Macedonian nobility who attended the king. Hermolaus had become murderously bitter towards Alexander over a perceived injustice. He and his accomplices were tortured and then stoned to death. Callisthenes, Alexander's official historian, was also implicated in the conspiracy. He was thrown in prison, where he later died. That summer, in 327, according to legend, Alexander became captivated by the beauty of Roxana, daughter of a Bactrian lord. Their marriage was also a sound political move, helping to end local revolt against his rule, and allowing him to continue his advance into modern Pakistan and India.
Alexander now prepared to subdue the Persian Empire's most eastern provinces, which had yet to recognise his kingship. To do so, he would first have to cross the Hindu Kush mountains, and reach the Indus River valley. Advancing in two columns, his army won a series of skirmishes against the Aspasi and Asakani, as they fought their way into what's now the Swat Valley of northern Pakistan. After a fierce siege, Alexander took the Asakanian capital of Masaga. According to legend, it was ruled by a beautiful queen, Cleophis, who bore Alexander a son and was allowed to keep her throne. The ruler of Taxila, near modern Islamabad, had formed an alliance with Alexander. Together, they marched to face Porus, king of Paravas, at the Battle of the Hydaspes. It was Alexander's costliest battle, as Porus's war elephants inflicted terrible casualties amongst the Greeks. But despite Porus's fearless leadership, the battle ended in a decisive victory for Alexander, winning him control of the Punjab. Alexander wanted to push on into India, to reach the Great River, which ancient Greek geographers said formed the edge of the world. But at the River Hyphasis, known today as the Bias, his army mutinied. His men had marched thousands of miles, fought countless battles, and not seen their homes in eight years. They'd heard rumours of gigantic armies waiting for them in India. They refused to go any further. Alexander was furious, but had to turn the army around. He followed the rivers of the Punjab to the sea, a journey that took ten months. On the way, he defeated the Malians, but while leading the assault on their capital, was wounded in the chest and nearly killed. On reaching the coast, part of the army under Nearchus boarded ships and returned to Persia by sea, sailing through the Straits of Hormuz and entering the Persian Gulf. It was one of the great ancient voyages of exploration, as these waters had been previously unknown to Greeks. So that's what a lot of the back and forth between Alexander and his army is at this point. This is the edge of the known world for Greece, and the only reason they know about this far is because of their contact with Persia. And so they essentially know of the Persian Empire, but even the far eastern and southeastern portions of the Persian Empire, those are all shrouded in a gray mist to the Greeks. So whenever Alexander is wanting to push on further than really where anybody knows where it goes, you start to have kind of these, well, these ideas of myth that have been built up over time in the Greek homeland of what exactly lays outside of the boundaries of the known world. And so they decide we've conquered this a ton of territory. We've given you an empire. We've been gone for forever. We don't really want to find out what's over there. You know, chances are it's not going to be great for us and we don't want to go. Whereas Alexander, who has just conquered this empire, has not lost he he that's essentially what is driving him is he wants to explore new territory he wants to conquer new territory and so the thing that is pushing alexander further is the thing that is pulling his troops further back and so this really is kind of an interesting dichotomy here and 
how big it kind of plays up into the minds of Greeks going all the way back, you know, to the Greco-Persian Wars. Meanwhile, Alexander led the rest of the army back by land through the Gedrosian Desert, today in southern Pakistan. But extreme heat and shortages of food and water led to terrible suffering and many deaths among his army. On his return to Persia, Alexander executed several of his viceroys and governors, men accused of ruling unjustly and robbing temples and tombs during his long absence in the east. At Susa, he arranged a magnificent mass marriage of Macedonian officers to 80 Persian noblewomen to strengthen bonds between his two kingdoms. Alexander himself married two Persian princesses. He also paid all his soldiers' debts and ordered 30,000 youths from across the empire to be trained in the Macedonian art of war. But at Opis, his Macedonian troops mutinied. They were offended by Alexander's apparent preference for Persian advisers and Persian ways. Alexander had the ringleaders executed and made a speech to the men reminding them of the glories they'd won together and leading eventually to an emotional reconciliation. At Ekbatana, Alexander's closest and most trusted friend, Hephaestion, died of fever. The king was grief-stricken, went days without eating, and ordered a period of public mourning across the empire. Alexander waged a successful campaign against the mountain raiders of Kossia, who not even the Persian kings had been able to subdue. Returning to Babylon, he was met by embassies from distant peoples, come to recognize his greatness. Ethiopians, Libyans, European Scythians, Lucanians, Etruscans, Gauls, and Iberians. So essentially, you have a group of people, or a lot of groups of people, stretching all the way from France and Spain, through Italy, through the steppes, down through Greece and Thrace and, and Macedonia. This is kind of like a, <clears throat> this is kind of like a breaching of a gap. This is such a large territory that most of these countries and peoples, they don't have reference to any of the other countries or peoples that are that far away. So this is similar, the, the Romans expand on this later on, but this is similar to what the Romans do, where because you have Roman culture and safety and roads and, and everything that it, it breaks down all of these barriers that had been there for forever for all of these people. And so you have people communicating and knowing of each other, trading that had never been done before. They didn't even know these, these people existed. Or, like we talked about with the Greeks, it was a kind of a mythical idea of what was over there or who was over there. And this makes it a very concrete reality. It's, it's really wild how big of an area this is. Alexander's Bactrian wife, Roxana, was now pregnant. But as he planned his next campaign to Arabia and beyond, he developed a sudden fever and died days later, aged just 32. The cause of Alexander's death has never been established. It may have been malaria, cholera, typhus, or poison. Yeah! 
Alexander died undefeated in battle. His reputation as a brilliant, fearless and daring military commander remains undimmed. His decade-long campaign created one of the largest empires ever known, stretching from Greece to Pakistan. But it was vast and unstable, held together only by his own brilliance and name. Alexander left no plans for his succession, and his generals soon began fighting among themselves to carve out their own empires. This is one of the things that the Persians don't get enough credit for. Whenever you have Cyrus the Great come in and establish the empire initially, it even changes the hands as far as the monarch is concerned. It goes from one family to another. It's kind of confusing how that happens, whether it was through assassination or... It, it's a confusing story. We'll cover it at some point on here. But when Darius the Great takes over the empire, that's a change of families that heads the Persian Empire. But because their leadership was so strong early on, and it wasn't just Cyrus. Had it just been Cyrus, this is probably what happens. It probably stays stable for a little bit, and then, you know, long enough after Cyrus has died, it probably collapses into a bunch of different regions. But they had essentially a pretty good string of leadership in the early part of the empire, and it allowed them to hold this vast territory together. The Macedonians and Alexander don't have that much luck here. It's going to start breaking down pretty quickly. In the wars of the successors, Alexander's widow Roxana and his young son were murdered. His own gold sarcophagus, en route to Macedonia for burial, was hijacked and ended up in Alexandria in Egypt. Today, its location remains one of the world's great unsolved mysteries. Few men have ever had such an impact on the course of history as Alexander the Great. The breathtaking achievements of his short life ushered in the Hellenistic Age, as Greek ideas spread across the territory of his former empire fusing with local traditions to trigger new developments in art, science, government and language. Some of the successor kingdoms to his great empire were short-lived. Others endured for centuries. But all, in turn, would fall to new forces. And in the west, to the rising Rome. power of Rome. Yeah, so Rome's actually going to have some issues with the successor, Philip V, I think, of Macedon. But they're going to have some issues uh, during the Punic Wars, where Philip V, I believe it's the V, actually allies with Carthage. And so that's going to bring those two, you know, they're going to start butting heads. But yeah, that was... That was Epic History TV's Alexander the Great Part 4. This was a really good series. I enjoyed it. If you have any other suggestions for future series, let me know. Um, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel, and I'll see you guys next time.